Okay. So this is Intro Chef. Uh, before we get started, how many people would identify themselves more with a developer type of role? Okay. And more of like an operations or admin? So a few. Okay. Great. Okay, so this is Intro to Chef. A little bit about me, like Colin said, I work here on the developer productivity team at IBM Watson. It's my Twitter handle, emails, GitHub. This will be on like the last slide too. So you have this problem. You have lots of machines. Maybe you have one machine or five machines or maybe you're at like Facebook scale. You have thousands of machines. You also have various software components. Uh, maybe you're working with Apache, uh, MySQL, Postgres, both at the same time. Uh, you also have to worry about your own software. It's not just machine uh, resources or machine services. You have multiple operating systems. You're really good at Debian. You know, you've gone to $1,500 training for this. You've, you run your blog on Debian. You're very familiar with Debian. Then your boss comes to you and tells you, we now support Solaris. So learn everything you can about Solaris real quick because we're putting it in production in like two months. Uh, you also may have, had, may have no documentation on any of this, or most often it's out of date. So you go to upgrade your Jenkins, it's your first day, you come in, you install, uh, you grab the newest war, you pull it down, you announce that you're going to be upgrading Jenkins, you throw in the war, you upgrade the plugins, and then you come back, tell everyone, okay, it's, it's ready to go. You come back, someone pings you later on and says, you know, none of my builds are pulling from our repository. So you go back in, you figure it out. A couple hours later, you figure out you've upgraded a plugin that you were using some hacked up copy of uh, because, you know, one feature broke one time, so you've, you've hard coded this. So then you have to revert everything, go back, test it again, make sure everything works. So you might think, uh, okay, I'll just keep my documentation uh, up to date. Um, here I have shown just one document for installing and configuring Apache. As you see, there's multiple links, levels of links, links within links, linkception. Uh, also, this is going to change from different versions. It's never going to be the same. And it's probably different across platforms. If you're a developer and you, and you get your new laptop on your first day and you try to set up your developer workstation, we all know it never works out within the first few hours. You might spend two days just trying to get your workstation set up. Then you get this workstation set up and you get a new laptop. Now you have to do that all over again. Or you have a laptop at home that you want to keep in sync because you like things. So here's instructions uh, for just a typical stack, a LAMP stack. So I don't know if you've ever used Node before, but just getting Node on a machine and then installing all of your modules can be a chore. So you might think, this seems kind of like a job for a Bash script, or even better, a Perl script. Uh, the problems with these are, as the problems sometimes the documentation, they might not get up to date, and two years from now you may have written this Perl, and most often you'll come back and have no idea what it does. So, Another thing is, these aren't very configurable per system unless you're throwing in a whole bunch of if and if else, uh, case statements, all of these things. Um, so I might think maybe a combination of documentation and scripts would work, but. <laughs> Indeed, want to be a baller. Uh, so the answer is Chef. Um, so Chef, uh, this is kind of a little bit of a rip off from Chef's site uh, because I couldn't figure out a way to explain it. Chef allows you to design your infrastructure as you would a software application. So simply a framework for defining your infrastructure as code. What does that mean though? If you've ever spent any time configuring services on machines, you know that every service comes with its own configuration file. It comes with its own microservice, the run under services. Uh, and every, every service has its own guide, and it's different, as I said, across all platforms. So you want a unified way to combine all of your configuration together 
such that you can put in uh, if or whens or anything so that you can uh, pull across, uh, sorry, you can pull your, uh, your code down and have it work across all operating systems or just the ones that you decide to work with. So why Chef? Maybe you've heard of Ansible, maybe you've heard of Salt, maybe you've heard of Puppet. I personally like Chef because one, it's written in Ruby. You might say Puppet's written in Ruby also, but Puppet forces you into a kind of a very specific DSL. Ansible can do the same. With Chef, you can write raw Ruby out and use it directly in your code. Also, some models can only be push. Uh, Ansible does this. So you set up your Ansible thing, you fire it off, and if SSH goes down and you're doing this across a whole bunch of machines, you're kind of SOL if it doesn't work. Chef takes a pool model whereby you have a Chef server where it, that stores all of your code and nodes that come online pool from the server. Normally you'll have a, a cron server set up such that this happens about every 30 minutes. This scales a lot better than push, as I said, SSH can be very unreliable. And also there's a very extensive community. If there's a service that you're looking to configure, the cookbook probably already exists, and I'll show you where later on. So your typical architecture is gonna look like this. You'll have your chef server, as I said, which is kind of the master model. This also contains all of your cookbooks, which I'll explain in a sec. And then over here, you have your nodes. These can be virtual machines, they can be cloud instances, physical servers, Docker images, whatever you're feeling. And then most of the magic happens on your workstation where you write cookbooks and you interact with the chef server through Knife. All this code is also uh, normally stored in a repository, probably in uh, Git. You can also use Subversion or whatever product you're feeling. So I keep on mentioning a cookbook. And what is a cookbook exactly? The cookbook is a basic building block of your infrastructure. A cookbook can represent a service. So you could have your Apache cookbook, or your MySQL cookbook, or your Postgres cookbook. A lot of times you'll take these cookbooks and you'll combine together in a wrapper type of cookbook, in which case you'll define an application that you want to install. Say you want to install Conboard or WordPress. So WordPress contains a few things. It contains Nginx. It contains the application itself. It contains MySQL. Uh, also, you might want to throw run it in there. So you're going to be combining your application, your MySQL, your Nginx cookbook, and a wrapper cookbook. And it kind of configures all of these things together. You also may have different environments for your application. You have a development environment where the settings of the machines are slightly lower than your production instance. So you want a way to deploy to all of them, but a way to override defaults for maybe memory or hard drive space. Or maybe you have a load balancer in production, but you don't have it in your dev. Okay, so I'm gonna roll right into a demo um, just to show you how to create a cookbook. So on my machine, I have a few things. You can choose to host your own Chef server, which is very easy. It actually uses Chef to install Chef. Um, or you can go with the hosted solution, which I would say if you're just messing around with this, you should go with the hosted solution for now just to play around and you don't have to worry about managing the server. So that's done here. Go to manage.chef.io, make yourself an account. I think it's blocking something. Okay, so you get a nice web interface like this. You can do most of the work through the web interface, or like I said before, you can use Knife to interact with it. 
Uh, a lot of the cooking terms are on purpose because it's called Chef. So to get started with this, like I said, you sign up for this account. You go in here to the administrative panel. You generate a knife config. You generate a user. And then you download a key. Shove all that under a .chef under your home directory, and you're ready to go. So the first cookbook I'm going to do is I'm going to piece it out. So Chef works off of uh, resources. And these resources represent certain things like a package or a template or a service. So the first thing that I did is I created this example, my Apache recipe. So this is a recipe that I created from scratch using this command, Burke's cookbook. And then the name of the cookbook that I want it to be. This will scaffold out a lot of files, and you'll end up with a directory similar to this here. A lot of these you can ignore for right now, but I want you to focus on attributes, recipes, and templates. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to crack up with the recipe. The recipe is going to define most of my logic for the steps that are going to be performed. So the first thing that I do is I need Apache itself. Because I'm targeting CentOS, I specify the package as HTTPD, because that's what I know what it is on uh, CentOS. So this right here is a resource, package HTTPD. The next thing I do is I want to override defaults that come with CentOS. So in here, I'm specifying where in my configuration I want this template to be. Uh, and that's going to come from the templates directory right here. It's an ERB, kind of like Rails. So the template where I want it is going to be etsy httpd conf http conf. Owner and group, permissions. And then down here, I actually want to start the service after it's done. Whenever I'm uh, configuring the service and I want to make changes to my conference file, I also want the service to be restarted to pick up those new changes. So that's what this does right here. I want to notify the service to restart every time something new happens here. So to give custom uh, Attributes, I go to the attributes file. You can think of attributes as almost global variables. They're, gonna cons they're going to be accessible throughout your whole cookbook, and then there's ways to reference them from wrapper cookbooks downstream. So I say, my Apache, name of my cookbook, where in my template I want to actually uh, change this, and then the value that I want assigned. So I'm changing two things in the template the timeout and the log level. Okay. And like I said, under under here is actually going to be that file that I referenced before. This is the http conf erb. Taking a look at it, Uh, like I said, I wanted to just change log level and timeout. So right here is where I'm doing that. Uh, if you look at it, it's very Rails-like. So you're doing the equals, and then name of the attribute that I want filled in here, and that'll get filled in. Timeout looks just the same. Here, this is the metadata file where I'll reference other cookbooks. Since I'm not referencing other cookbooks, this is going to be largely blank. However, I want to be cognizant of the version 
which is a Semver version. To test cookbooks on my local machine, I'm going to use a mixture of a tool called uh, Test Kitchen, which comes shift with the Chef DK, which you can find and download here. Uh, this will be your complete package for interacting with Chef. It contains all the tools necessary to test, create cookbooks, and interact with your Chef server. So Test Kitchen is a gem that comes shipped with this. And I can test to make sure this works using kitchen. If I do a kitchen list, I can see what operating systems and suites that I have set up. Currently, I'm just testing for Ubuntu and CentOS. We know this is going to fail on Ubuntu because the way that I structured the recipe, just because this is an intro, uh, I didn't put any defaults in for what happens if I want to do this on Ubuntu. I configure this with a kitchen file. So I'm using Vagrant as the driver for this. The type of provision I'm using Chef Solo, the platforms that I'm targeting, and I'm referencing the run list. The run list has the ordering for which recipes are gonna run when. So I just referenced that I'm running this local cookbook here. So I do a kitchen converge. CentOS. If I don't have this, it's going to pull down the machine from the Vagrant Hub. Normally, it's going to be a Chef-provided box. And then it's going to run something called Chef Solo. So as I said before, the normal model is you're going to have your Chef server, and you're going to have nodes that are pulling from that. If you don't like that model, you can use something called Chef Solo, in which case it's going to run all of this locally, but you need to have particular steps for how do I get Chef on the machine, how do I set up paths, and I need to pro provide uh, some sane defaults for how Chef Solo is going to run. So this will run for a bit, uh, and then we'll see at the very end how it works. Uh, there's a lot of information to throw at you at once, so real quick, does anybody have any questions specifically about this recipe at the moment? None? Okay. So like I said, the first thing it's going to do is it knows uh, several different options to grab Chef. And it grabs this uh, from packages provided by Chef. It'll try wget, it'll try curl, it'll try Python. Some of these things aren't listed out uh, by default on a machine. So it'll grab that and start to converge while that's running. We can go over here because uh, obviously a lot of people have probably done this before. So we can go to Supermarket. Super, Supermarket has cookbooks created either by ops code or by individual contributors themselves. Most of these are going to be hosted on GitHub. And you're going to be able to uh, search the ops code approved ones or the chef approved ones through this interface. So we're looking for Apache. Go in here, search Apache. And we get multiple options. There's not always going to be one because people have different use cases for Apache. So we'll choose this one. And we can see a little bit of information in the README about how to reference this. As I said before, you can pull in other cookbooks. So you're going to be referencing this as Apache 2. Uh, we see a version that we can lock to here. We could also check out the source, which is normally on GitHub, right here. So this will provide a bunch of sane defaults for uh, Apache. And it'll also go ahead and probably throw in some other things like Apache modules. Or you can even create whole websites. Leave down here it says that. Yeah, web app. So you can see an example right here. So these are things that we're familiar with. They decided to call their resource web app. You can create custom resources and providers, but that's more of an advanced topic, so I'm not covering it today. Uh, but he's just referencing the template. And this is an attribute right here. So we go back over here. We see that everything is finished. So we can actually log into this machine to check um, if this is installed. Or you could write tests 
similar to our spec to run these at the very end. Let's catch in login. Okay. We can check that the service is actually running. Dead, but syslog's locked. So there might have been a problem actually with the configuration file. We could take a look at that here. if this just did not use my file. Okay, So 120 was actually what I said it. I'm not sure why it's not searching. Um, that got put in right here. Uh, we could take a look at log level, if search was working. Unimportant. So this is a basic example of how to create your cookbook from scratch. Um, as I said before, you can pull in other cookbooks. So I'm going to demonstrate how to do that. Seth Vargo is supposed to be here. Um, and I'm using one of his cookbooks, actually, to demonstrate. So we're going to go to supermarket. Um, how many people have played with Jenkins before? OK. So Jenkins is uh, for building normally your source code. Uh, you can take a look at it right here. It's Jenkins, you can download packages. So Jenkins comes with its own set of steps for installing itself. And it's different across platforms. So I want to figure out, is there a way that I can install Jenkins without doing all this myself? So I look here, I see Jenkins. I see this is actually sponsored by Chef, so to say. By sponsored, I mean it lives under the repos, basically. I can take a look at the source. So I figure out that this has a couple of dependencies itself. It depends on the Java cookbook. It depends on the Nginx cookbook. It depends on the uh, Runit cookbook. And like I said, you can find out dependencies of it right here. But you don't really have to worry about that, because Chef comes with its built-in dependency manager, similar to RubyGems, and it's called Burke Shelf. So to use this cookbook in my, in my environment, I'm going to take a look at some of the defaults that it comes with. If you notice, it doesn't have a default recipe. Default recipes are normally run every time, but you can specify specific recipes right here. So he has a Java recipe where all he does is install the Java DK using the package. He has a couple of whens in here for when it's Debian, use this package. When it's rel, use this package. And that's just a simple case statement. And then I want to install a master node. So I see that's where a lot of the magic is going to happen right here. So using this environment, like, like before, I did a Burks cookbook, create, my Jenkins test. If I do a tree, looks very similar. Because I'm defining a dependency, because I'm pulling, I have to define my dependencies here. So I'm going to be pulling in Jenkins directory, directly. Um, like I said, there's some, sometimes there's more copies of the Jenkins cookbook. We could figure out exactly what it's called by looking in the metadata, and we see this is called Jenkins. So I put that right here. I'm going to be deploying this on an Ubuntu machine, so I want to include the apt cookbook too. This cookbook uh, has a little bit uh, more configuration that we don't need to go to, but it's important because it updates my repositories before 
uh, it tries to install any packages. So to use this cookbook, I just say include recipe. How do I know what the recipe was called? It's right here. Right. So I include the recipe apt. If I don't specify the specific recipe, it's going to assume the default recipe. So I just say apt, it assumes default, it's going to run the default recipe, which is going to reload my cache. And then I say I want Java on this machine. Jenkins has a dependency on Java. And then I want to set up a master. So one of the cool things is Jenkins ships with its own attributes, which I can override in my cookbook. So in here, we have a hard-coded value in Jenkins. of nil. So normally this is probably just going to go and pull the latest version. I know very specifically that my code is not interacting with Jenkins uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. So in my attributes, I say that I want to lock this to 1, 5, 9, 8. So as before, I say the name of the cookbook that I'm targeting I'm saying the attribute within that cookbook that I'm targeting, and I'm locking it to a specific value. So I could run this kitchen test, but I know that it's going to work, and this takes a little bit. So what I'm going to do, go ahead. So if you want to install a, a cookbook, uh, but you want to, to have your own variables or you know, change configurations, do you need to create a new cookbook that depends on the original one? Yeah, so you can pull in all of the original recipes and values and everything just by calling it in yours here. So I'm saying I want the Jenkins cookbook, and I'm overriding parts of the cookbook, like here. I'm overriding the version attribute that's listed in this cookbook. If this was the Nginx cookbook, I'd probably have default Nginx, and then maybe another timeout and setting it to something else. Does that make sense? Okay. Is it worth mentioning that this strategy is only one of a couple of the communities a little bit not really in agreement on that strategy? Yeah. So I'll mention that probably at the end. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, before I set up a instance in DigitalOcean. Uh, so I have that instance right here. It's an Ubuntu instance. So to upload this cookbook to my Chef server, I'm going to use Burke Shelf so that all of my dependencies come with it. So I do a Burke's upload. If I do a dot, it should pick up the directory that I'm currently in. Or not. So this has already been uploaded before, and I see this is the same Semver version that I have listed in my metadata here. Okay. So now I use knife to interact with my chef server. And I'm going to bootstrap a new node. The IP of that is here. I list the user, I list the password, and then I say in my chef server, what do I want this to be called? So it's going to go out. 
It's going to go ahead and install its uh, chef, bootstrap it. Then I should be able to see that over here in chef manage under nodes. Oh yeah, the JavaScript. Okay. So I see Jenkins right here. So now I need to edit this run list. So I do a knife, node, edit, name. And then I can specify in my run list here using JSON what I want it to be. I can also do that through the web interface. I can edit the run list here. I could search for what I just uploaded. Drag that over. Save the run list. Run Chef Client. Let's go ahead and run Chef Client. So this is going to take a little bit. Uh, any more questions at this point? Go ahead. So you mentioned um, DigitalOcean and Bird Can you explain what those tools are and Yeah, so DigitalOcean is just a cloud provider. Right here, where you can spin up virtual machines or Docker instances. I think you can do Docker instances somewhere. But this is just the cloud provider that I decided to choose. Uh, so I have a virtual machine running in here. Yeah, I'm gonna have to log in and everything. Do you need me to log in, or does that make sense with DigitalOcean? Okay. So Berkshelf, as I said before, is a dependency manager. There's a lot of uh, quarrel, I guess, over which dependency manager to use. Uh, Chef has largely kind of backed Berkshelf, but this was kind of based on the purpose that it was there, and uh, they didn't feel like doing the work. So they latched onto Berkshelf. Uh, Berkshelf, you could find information about here, where you can learn all about uh, locking versions of cookbooks, uh, running Berks install to grab all your dependencies. And it runs similar like Ruby gems. So Chef themselves host an endpoint here, supermarketchef.io, which contains all these cookbooks. So when you say Jenkins, it goes here, retrieves the cookbook, knows that's the dependency. It'll pull it down on your machine or pull it down onto the server. Um, there's also a specific, uh, so once your stuff is up in your Chef server, some people threw a lot of their cookbooks under a central repo, which they called Chef Repo. And then it was Chef Repo, cookbooks, all of my cookbooks. So you could keep track of it that way. Dan, did you? Oh, I thought you were raising your hand like you had something to say. I can complain about something you said. Not, yeah. not the, what you said, but I can complain about that. that okay. Thing, then it's fine. Okay. So, run finished. Fingers crossed. Going to do that because Jenkins runs on 8080. Right, so now I have Jenkins up here. So I know absolutely zero about setting up Jenkins, but I can include the recipe and someone's done all the work to set it up. Now, this is going to be custom out of the box, so I'm going to have to dig in to figure out what other type of recipes I want to add to further configure this. Um, but it's up and running, it's in DigitalOcean. So, just back to slides. So, a lot of information that I just threw out. Um, where to go from here? I wanted you to walk away from here having a basic understanding of some of the principles, but I don't expect you to go back and throw everything in and get started. Chef themselves publish great video tutorials at learn.chef.io. Also, you could take at, a look at Seth Vargo's book and Misha Taylor's at Intro to Chef. It's a book uh, published by O'Reilly. When you're ready to step up your game, you've read through these books, you've maybe watched some conference videos, you can take a look at Customizing Chef, written by John Cowie, right here. Okay. 
So uh, here's my information again. You can email me at samuelluciano at chagoon.io. You can take a look at my GitHub, and here's my Twitter. Any further questions? Go ahead. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of times, like say you just do not like the Apache recipe. You can create your own Apache recipe. You can upload it to your site. You can run your own Burke shelf file to grab dependence or Burke shelf server to grab dependencies. A lot of times, this is what you're going to be doing. Um, you'll find a cookbook maybe that you like. You'll include it in your own wrapper cookbook. You'll override a crap ton of variables, and you'll upload it to your chef server recipe. So one type of thing that you have a problem with is, say you didn't lock the cookbook to a specific version, and they go and they completely change the cookbook. And you have dependencies strongly on that cookbook because you said pull the latest, which is probably going to do every time. And it breaks all of your stuff. Um, this is a common problem, which is why another reason why Burke Shelf was included, so you could lock your version specifically. If you look here. I see the current version is 222. So if I'm really comfortable with 222, it's working for me, no man I'm going to want to lock my wrapper cookbook to a specific upstream cookbook. And that way I know it's not going to change. And if it does change, it's going to be locked and it's not going to pull the latest. I do that right here. So it works kind of like a gem file. You can specify exactly this cookbook. You can say um, at least this cookbook and greater. Or you can say ranges, like I want greater than this cookbook, but less than this cookbook. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. Did I answer your question? I'm not sure if I fully answered it or uh, not. I think you answered the question. <laughs> OK. Um, but maybe I'll rephrase it. I got to think about it first. OK. So if you have your own application that right. you're deploying to, mm -hmm. let's say, Apache or wherever, and you want to create a custom cookbook for it that yeah. has all of your configuration in it, what does that process look like, right? You're not deploying Jenkins or something else that there's already a cookbook out there for. Right? Mm -hmm. right? So if I work at IBM and I want to deploy Watson, right. and I need to create a cookbook for that, mm -hmm. where would I start and what I need to do? Okay. What does that look like? Yeah, so <laughs> deploying applications with Chef, while it can be done, is not 100% a common process. So there's been a major rewrite on a lot of these application cookbooks for deploying these things. Um, so if I look at Chef Cookbook, Java application. Here's an example of a cookbook um, that's going to get all of your Java dependencies. And it forces you into kind of a certain workflow. which you'll see down here. And a lot of this mimics a type of Capistrano, if you're familiar with Capistrano and Ruby type of workflow. Um, but here, he's mentioning, this is a Java web app, OK? I want this database. And then further down, oh, he lists where my specific application is. Because it's Java, it comes normally in a war file, so it's easy to just throw on there, point your war at it, and you're ready to go. A lot of people that are writing custom cookbooks for their application are going to be doing a lot of customization on resources and providers itself. So you're almost creating your own resource, like Java web app. You're giving it these parameters, and then you write something called a provider. So you can think of resource as the declaration of what I want it to be, and the provider is another file with the steps to actually get to that point. Chef works with something called like a declarative, where you say how I want it to be, and then Chef knows how to get to that point. But with your custom application, you're going to have to write a provider to tell it how to get to that point. 
It's an advanced topic. It can be done with just recipes. You can use the bash uh, resource itself to just do as you normally would do in a bash script. Um, or you can call on other scripts that you already have to set up your application. Or you could just use Chef to set up the infrastructure and use whatever existing deployment technologies you have. Um, one thing that I've done personally is I've used Chef to set up the infrastructure and then I have my app in a Docker container. And so I just have Chef pull that Docker container down and it ha Docker has all the dependencies from my application in it and it runs those. So creating your own custom cookbooks is something that you'll see a lot of in the Customizing Chef book where he talks about writing your own providers, your own resources, and goes into a lot more of that depth. Um, but it's quite an advanced topic. And Chef themselves don't necessarily, while the marketing people might say, um, yeah, use Chef to deploy your applications, not a whole lot of people are using it to deploy um, their own custom applications without a whole bunch of work going into creating a custom resource, a custom provider, and whatnot. Does that make sense? Yeah. Go ahead. How do you convince an employer to let you run a service like Chef when you have hard enough time just getting them to create a man for the user accounts we all the non LDAP user accounts? So you're saying, how do I convince my employer that this is important to let yes. me use it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, this could probably be a talk all of itself, but one of the things that you might be able to do is maybe just go ahead and benchmark how much time you're saving by putting all of this into automation. And then say, oh, now I can work on more advanced problems. Maybe we wanted to introduce that new monitoring system a uh, day ago. But I'm so busy logging into these machines, tweaking a little line, and then logging back out and logging into the next machine, and then tweaking this little line. But oh, I messed it up. So now I need to go back into that machine and then tweak the line again. Also, you're going to need to spend a lot more money maybe on training or a lot more time just figuring out different operating systems. I'm not sure if you only run one operating system. Um, but I, I've considered, uh, I would consider myself very uh, productive with CentOS. Uh, but then I needed to learn Solaris. So now I need to go learn Solaris. That's going to be a, a huge time suck. Whereas I can use these automation solutions to uh, leverage the work that they've already done with Solaris to get that on there. Um, I have shown the hosted kind of SaaS provider, but like I said, most people are gonna be running their chef server within their organization behind a firewall. You can also set up your own Burke shelf uh, dependency manager for this and, uh, or librarian. I'm not really sure how librarian works. Um, the best thing to do is just to kind of show them the time savings, show them the real value of these things. Any other questions? All right, thank you for your time. <laughs>